Okay, well, um, thank you very much. We're, uh, this is um, Peter Hall and Anna Kairis um, uh, meeting with uh, Ron Bazran, um, who is uh, the proprietor of the, uh, the Boathouse um, pub in uh, Queensborough. Uh, I have to correct you on that. It's Frankie G's Boiler House pub. Boiler House, Boiler House. <laughs> Frank. um, how did, <laughs> before we go any further, how on earth did it get the name Frankie G's Boiler House? Well, uh, a long story short, uh, we had a contest to name the pub uh, before our opening, and we were getting all kinds of uh, uh, names that just didn't quite fit what we were looking for. So, um, without getting into a long story, it ended up my partner, who is Paul, his nickname was Frank. Okay. And I don't know how you get Frank out of Paul, but that's a, uh, that's how it was. And growing up as a young fellow, they used to call me Jeech. So our wives said, why don't you just put the two nicknames together, and yeah. we'll call it Frankie G's Pub. Yeah. And that's where it came from. Okay. The Boiler House is because of what our family did uh, in uh, New Westminster here. We're in the industry of supplying steam yeah. to to heat uh, 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 for instance one was the Royal Columbian Hospital in New Westminster but uh, the pole mills up and down the coast and that's why this boiler behind us okay. is that theme is uh, is to to represent the, our, our background and what we do and that's the design of the building to look like a boiler house um, can you uh can you start us then with how your family came to be um, came to be in that industry in in Queensbury and, and New Westminster? In the the early early nineteen uh, hundreds, uh, my family uh, arrived here in in uh, Vancouver and moved into Queensboro. Now they, my uh, mother uh, and her family, lived directly behind the pub here, just only a half a block behind. Yeah. Uh, with the big willow trees back there. Mm -hmm. uh, she was born and raised on the island. Uh, today she is the oldest uh, oldest resident that is born and raised and never left the island. And uh, she just lives down the road. And how our family got in the industry directly across the road here, this was all sawmills along the river and in behind us and there was shipbuilding on the corner. And my grandfather, uh, who got into the trucking business delivering firewood uh, around the New Westminster Queensboro, New Westminster area, and, and that's how our family got into that line, into the forest industry. Okay, so, so your grandfather was delivering firewood? That's correct. And um, he had his own trucking firm to do that, or delivery firm? That's correct. <coughs> okay. Um, and then, um, did you uh, did you follow in the family line of business? Well, uh, my father, who um, arrived uh, in in Victoria when he was three years old, okay, uh, did the same thing. Was a driver uh, for a company, and they delivered uh, uh, firewood and coal throughout Souk and Squimal for the army barracks. Uh, saying that, uh, he did that through his uh, younger years, and he um, came over to New Westminster here. When he married uh, my mother in, uh, I believe it was 1946, uh, sorry, 1946. Um, and they lived here in Queensboro, just a few blocks from here. Mm -hmm. Do they remember the flood, 48? Um, Yes, um, my my uh, my grandparents uh, remember the flood. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not too sure uh, that time uh, my dad, uh, but but it was at that time everybody volunteered all the help possible. Mm -hmm. So you would do your job uh, on your regular day uh, shift, and then if you could put in a few hours or even a whole eight-hour shift sandbagging, uh, everybody got together. And there is a picture of, of some of the families that were uh, sandbagging here in the pub uh, during that flood time. So as we continued on, my, my, um, my father was in the trucking industry, uh, working for the sawmills. Uh, after I graduated and I, I uh, did one year of college and I thought, well, I think it's time for me to get in the, the family business. 
because uh, it seemed that that's what was in my heart. So, mm-hmm. so up to today, I'm still in it. I'm in the forest industry. I still do it. Um, my son was my my uh, my brothers were in it. We're uh, in our company, partnership in our company. My son was part of the business uh, up to about six years ago, and I moved him out of that and moved him into the service industry here at the pub. Um, the the uh, what year did you graduate college, or what year did you graduate high school? Should I say? I graduated in nineteen sixty nine. Okay. So um, one of the things that we've uh, been um, interested in understanding <coughs> is the way that the, the the forest industry has changed in 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 its relationship to the. To the to the to the new Westminster Port, um, we we understand that in days gone by, the uh, lumber mills would put um, wood on on barges on scows, and then they would take that uh, float those down to the to the to the terminals, and they'd be loaded into the ships, and then at some point, um, that became uh, more of a trucking uh, operation with packaged lumber. So do you, do, you have, do you have any insights on, on that change in the industry? Well, what's happened in the industry here, and I will, I will answer where, where we are today. I'll, I'll, I'll go back a little bit, and then I'll, I'll, I will let you know where we are today in the industry. Um, many years ago, they used to float the lumber alongside the barges, uh, or alongside the, the freighters uh, mm-hmm. that come into port. Uh, that changed, and because of the handling and and the machinery now that was available uh, at that time, at a later time, and I'm I'm talking after they were floating the barges, uh, they started to truck lumber to the North Shore, which was one of the main terminals um, for receiving lumber. And the freighters would come in there and and load lumber for overseas. Uh, so that that changed after uh, I'm not just quite sure what year but then everything they decided to do was to containerize everything and now lumber today uh, I would have to say that it's probably in the high 80% 90% is is now in containers for uh, for handling purposes shipping uh, that number could be even higher what's happened is in the forest industry the logs that are coming in are being towed in from from up the coast of Vancouver Island, Queen Charlotte's area, or were brought in and man, and milled here, and then trucked to the dock and overseas. So the, with the barges, the barges, I, I'm I'm not positive on uh, what year that changed, but I would I would say it had to be uh, uh, very early 60s, if not late 50s. Uh, and, and then it went heavier to trucking. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vancouver Island um, continued to barge for quite a while because of the ferry traffic and having transport trucks. So they were barging lumber. Right. Uh, but then also they had freighters that were going into into ports in, on Vancouver Island uh, because of the cost of, uh, mm-hmm. of shipping it over to Vancouver. Tiny little ports on the island. That's right. That's yeah. right. They were limited the size of freighters that they could bring in. Yeah, yeah. So where Vancouver and the North Shore were they had decent sizes. Uh, a lot of lumber used to go one time through New Westminster. New Westminster was quite a port. Yeah. Uh, uh, any given time, you may see four freighters along the river. Uh, uh, very, very active waterfront. Um, as a young fellow, I could still remember it. Uh, and uh, there was coal storage, so there was uh, uh, up one end of the, uh, of the river, uh, the other end was a, a, a large cannery, Royal City canneries. Uh, I don't know if any of that stuff went overseas, but we had a lot of, lot of different product come into to, uh, New Westminster, and lumber was one of the bigger ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, so can you, back in those days, so thinking, you know, we're thinking back now to when you, when you graduated high school and you, and you, you said you were going to get into the family business, what would, a, what would a, a normal day of work have looked like for you? Well, normal, uh, the, the, the type we were in in the industry uh, was the transportation side, mm-hmm. okay? So, uh, I mean, a normal shift was uh, 7 to seven to 3.30, and then it would be a shift change, and then on. 
But when you're a truck driver, there's no such thing as a normal shift. Mm-hmm. You work 10, 12, 14, 16, whatever, whatever was required at, uh, at, uh, to move the product. We moved, uh, most of my traffic was a product they call chips and hog fuel. And just to clarify on that, hog fuel is the waste off a log uh, It's after they debark, which is the bark, the sawdust, the shavings after the board has gone through the planer. So that is classed as hog fuel. Chips are the waste wood of either the trim end of the board or parts of the log that go through a chipper, and that product is used for the paper industry. That's what our paper use print, uh, depending on the species. Mm-hmm. So you would have the white paper or newsprint or whatever the case might be. And, uh, so that was with the chips. So we, I used to haul... Uh, that product either for landfill or uh, roadways, building roads. A lot of our roads are built out of hog fuel. Okay. The 401 is out of hog fuel. 176 is a hog fuel. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's areas in the Willington area of the 401 is hog fuel. There's a number uh, uh, that I can list that, that I've worked on. The Richmond connector is all hog fuel. Okay. Um, and then the connector from the bridge. Uh, that was what I hauled. I got into the lumber in, uh, I started transporting lumber uh, about 1981. And I moved lumber from parts of New Westminster and right across the street from here uh, to parts in California, Oregon, uh, and up to Prince George and BC Alberta border and back. Okay. So we moved quite a bit of lumber uh, throughout the interior. Uh, it's, uh, it's funny that you take lumber up or veneer up and you bring lumber back. So, you wonder that sometimes can't these two mills get together and just keep it in the same area. Uh-huh. But, uh, that's marketing and, and different species, of course, and, and different products. So. And they wanted it. They wanted to ha- create a good job for you. Yeah, well, I guess so. <laughs> Trucking was a, a major thing in the forest industry. Uh-huh. It uh, it employed a lot of people. There was a lot of people in the mills themselves. Uh, you know, you could have up to three hundred. 300 men in, a, in one sawmill to be working over three shifts. Uh, then the spinoff from those from those mills, uh, the ones that employed the trucking companies, uh, the product that employed people up at the pulp mill, the chips that would go up to the pulp mills and be used for for newsprint and the paper industry. And so the local sawmill, you'll see the so- local sawmill say, well, okay, there's extra men working in it, but it's unbelievable. The employment it creates mm-hmm. down the line. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Was there um, um, when you? I want to first talk a little bit about when you were doing the chips and hog fuel. Um, that was all within the Metro Vancouver region, pretty much. Um, my my hog fuel was all within the Vancouver area, Metro Vancouver. Uh-huh. Um, and, and the chips. Our lumber was uh, the broader area that we traveled in, mm-hmm. through three states and, and BC. And and why did you why did you make the shift from the one segment of the industry to another? Well, it was basically uh, because of my contracts. Mm-hmm. So instead of having two carriers, they'd prefer uh, a tender on one. And uh, it, it worked well for me because then if one side of the business was a little slower, the drivers would pick up on the other side. So that was the reason that uh, that we did both of. Uh, uh, I never did do the logging. Well, I shouldn't say that. I did. I did touch logging, uh, but just in the Metro Vancouver. Uh, I didn't as much as I always wanted to to do the logging in Vancouver Island or in the interior of British Columbia because I mean it was just a total different game and a very interesting one mm-hmm. when you're a young fellow being able to work up in the bush. Um, I didn't. I didn't do that. I, I stayed with the sawmills here. Okay, okay. And um, and so so you you could have been contracting for the same firm, the same mill to do chips and hog fuel one year and and lumber and boards the next year. Yeah, I I did, yeah. I, I did uh, quite a bit for all the majors. Um, I did my one of my larger contracts was with Macmillan Bloedel. And the reason for that is because this island had three divisions. Uh, one, two, yes. This island had three divisions uh, that were McMillan Bloedel, 
Also, I worked for two divisions in Burnaby uh, uh, that were McMillan. So I was known throughout their organization, so it, uh, I sort of took them on, or they took me on throughout to theirs, <coughs> I guess because of my history with the company. Mm -hmm. uh, Canadian Force was my, probably my second one, um, and I did quite a bit with Canadian Force. Uh, I did a fair amount with Doman Industries and the interior uh, interfort group so I, I basically worked just about for all the uh, most of the sawmills that mm -hmm. were in the area mm -hmm. from one way or another mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. how many um, how many uh, drivers uh, did you have well <laughs> I had uh, at one time my my highest peak in the business was um, probably in the mid 80s uh, at that time I was uh, running uh, about 20 company drivers and I had 30 lease operators. Uh, lease operators are uh, people with their own tractors and, and sub-lease for me. So we were, we were running uh, almost a 50 truck operation at one time, yes. And, uh, and today? Today we're, uh, we are now making our own product, so we're not for hire, so in the trucking industry uh, you might say we're basically not in the trucking industry. Uh, any product we haul is our own product. We are still doing the same thing, uh, but mainly hog fuel. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and we we move that product to either to directly to a reload operation, or we'll move it to a sawmill, load the barges, and send the barges up the coast. So we are moved from more trucking to water now. And that is due to traffic, cost, labor cost. Um, sorry, when you say you're 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 really you're 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 moving on own account. Do you have a mill now? Is that no, no? Oh. We we what we do is uh, we have in we brought in machinery that actually grinds the product. Mm -hmm. So we take all the wood waste. Uh, and it comes from, into, from it comes from different operations. It could come from sawmills. Okay. It can come from small factories, uh, cabinet operations, things like that. Uh, we have solid waste, which is anything from your picket fence to whatever wood there is. That's uh -huh. called solid waste. Uh -huh. There's two types of product we take. One is industrial waste, which is from sawmills, factories, and things like that. Then we take solid waste, which is from uh, could be from residential, could be things that to go to the landfill right and that's where our industry now is focused more on recycling uh -huh. uh, we take this product in that would be heading for the landfills but now it comes to us we we process through the big grinders and then we'll truck it to a local mill for barge service mm -hmm. and it'll go up the coast and it'll be used for either heat electricity steam, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of our product now is electricity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're taking waste energy. <clears throat> so where is uh, where is your main facility? Our main facility is on River Road in Delta. We're just uh, east of, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, west of the Alex Fraser Bridge. Uh, I've been over there since 1992. Uh, prior to that, we we're here uh, in Queensboro, just down the road here. Uh, on a site and we we're doing the same thing but that what product was being used for something else which uh, probably a lot of people don't know it was uh, going to Canadian forest products and they would break it down mat it and send it over to Japan and it would come back on the Honda dashboard and door panels okay very interesting wood waste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wood waste was only a component of what what was what was in the product. Yeah, was, yeah, uh, yeah. But that's what it, it come back in the so it, it left here uh, probably less than a quarter mile. It was just down the end of the road. It went into New Westminster. So we're talking probably uh, let's say ten miles, twelve miles into New Westminster, and then it went to the North Shore in Bales, went overseas come back in a in an automobile directly behind that cyclone that you see there directly on the other side of the river on Annis's Island they came back in an automobile so very interesting a lot of people a lot of people don't know that 
that, that, um, so uh, the the Queensborough site that you were pointing at is is down the road. It's the old BC <coughs> box manufacturing. That's, that's correct. My that was one of the first jobs that my grandfather had. Okay, and that's where he got his start. And through the years, as I you know, either my father or myself, we moved around from different areas, and I mean just our, our equipment, and we were very small, we were just a two truck operation, and I relocated back on the site, and I have some of the old timers that were kicking around telling me that where my office is situated my, was where my grandfather's was. I have no pictures, no nothing, and uh, you know, just going by, what I, well some of the pictures we have here, but never did have a picture of his office where mm -hmm. his trucks were. I guess cameras just weren't that available like we have today. Yeah. And apparently, where uh, my yard and my office was was exactly where his yard and office was. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, why did you decide to move? Uh, why did you move from Queensborough to River Road? Well, the development is what moved us. Uh -huh. um, at that time, like I said, there was a mills out here. This directly across here was a pole division, and then what they did, they peeled poles for the telephone, these telephone poles and everything. That's that's what they did over Cross Road here. Further down, uh, during the war and stuff, when it was it was BC Box and stuff, uh, first was a sawmill, then they built after the, I believe it was after the war. Uh, after the uh, the war. Um, they were building apple boxes for the, the, the interior. So, so uh, in Queensborough, like I said, we had uh, uh, four major sawmills, uh, I'm sorry, three major and a pole mill uh, in Queensborough. Uh, three of them were McMillan, uh, one was uh, at later date today, when before it closed, it was an Interfor mill. And I'm um, just trying to think of the name. It'll come back to me, but I forget the name of the, the one prior to that. But I'll, I'll touch on the, the big one that was on the, the west end of this of, the, of Queensboro. And today, that's the area where um, the shopping Queensboro Landing is. Mm -hmm. Now, for hog fuel, for many years, in the summer months, the pulp mills couldn't handle the volume of hog fuel. So it always got either dumped in landfills or in piles of stuff. And the actual landing, part of the actual landing, was a mountain of hog fuel. And I'm, again, I wish I had a picture of it. It was just a, a mountain for years and years. And I used to do that in the, in the summer. Uh, and I didn't even have a driver's license because we just used the road on the dike. And we'd haul from the back of the mill to the sawdust pile. And, but it never got picked up until 19, I did this when I was probably, you know, for a, uh, during the summer for uh, probably three or four weeks when the pole mills couldn't handle it. Um, product didn't get picked up until 19, about 1972. Mm -hmm. There was a shortage of hog fill and um, the company went in to buy the land and they wanted it clear because now it was a fire hazard. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and U.S. Minister wanted to see that go away. So we picked up all that hog fuel, and then when the landing went in, it had to be also dug out. So we went down probably uh, from road grade another 20 feet to dig it, to dig it out, because it all settled, it just kept sinking. And before those stores and everything could be built, that product had to be uh, extracted from the, the from the ground. So when you, when you for the for people who don't know, can you can you describe physically what hog fuel looks like? And when you say you had to pick it up, did does, are, are we talking about picks and shovels, or are we talking? Or, you know, describe the physical work okay, that, it, that was it, involved. When it, when it come out of a hog, uh, out of a when it come out of the sawmill, it would be trim ends, uh, sawdust, uh, bark, and bark could be stringy. It could be two three feet long if it's cedar. Mm -hmm. If it's hemlock fir, it's just small pieces. And it goes into a machine that's called a hogger. And that's how it gets its name hog fuel. Because the end product is used for fuel. Mm -hmm. The machine is the hogger. So it was called hog fuel. Mm -hmm. okay. And then it comes out, and it'll come out, be conveyed out to, uh, could be, you know, a hopper 
or uh, it could be on the ground and reloaded by front end loader, uh, or you could have a truck sitting under a, a chute. And when we say when we picked up the pile, removed the pile, it's all done by front end loaders. Yeah. Now, that, and, and that, why couldn't they keep up during the summer? Because uh, usually they didn't need that much steam because of the weather. That would weather was always a major factor. Uh, they don't use a lot of hog fuel in the summer months, okay, and and then of course uh, in the winter months because like today, I mean technology and everything is a lot different. But uh, when when steam is traveling distance through the mills and stuff, they didn't they didn't have them insulated like we have today. You know, so they lost a lot of energy. Okay. So saying that, they had to use more fuel to keep the energy up. Uh, the, the waterfront here in Queensborough is, just, like I said, it's changed so much. I mean, down this end here, uh, where these two mills were, now you see the, the Port Royal development. It stayed vacant land for a number of years uh, due to change of companies. Uh, the time that Macmillan sold out uh, and no longer in business, so that land just sort of sat there until it was sold, and the developer sat on it for a while. It went under construction here a few years ago. Uh, it's pretty much 80% completed. Mm -hmm. So that's replaced two mills. On the other side, uh, we have the, the larger mill, which was replaced by um, the landing, the shopping outlet. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, there was another operation to the west side of that, which now you see is uh, the casino. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a, 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 a sawmill on that side. Um, well, the paper mill is still in between the sawmill, and uh, I'm just trying to think what was on it. I'll have to, I'll have to come back to that one, what was on that site uh, where the casino is. But then coming over this side to the east, uh, the northeast corner, um, that mill closed, uh, again, due to what the, my understanding is, is that that type of log wasn't available anymore. So they closed that operation. Now the port of Vancouver is uh, warehousing and, and container traffic goes through there. In New Westminster, on the other side, uh, I guess we can call the, the Third Avenue Key West area. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a very large mill there, uh, Alaska Pine. It was probably one of the bigger, probably one of the bigger fires that ever happened in New Westminster after the city. Uh, the great fire in New Westminster. The sawmill uh, caught fire. And they brought water bombers in from Vancouver Island to, to try to put that fire out. It was, it was a, a very, very large fire. Uh, saying that, they decided to rebuild the mill. Mm -hmm. It was called Rainier at the time. Uh, I'm sorry, I wouldn't know. If it was, it was Laska Pine and it was Rainier. I'm not sure which one was first. Right. Uh, and then they rebuilt the mill. Uh, and then it was sold to Domans. And uh, I worked out of that mill for a number of years hauling uh, uh, hog fuel and everything else. They closed that again to uh, waterfront value of land takes over sometime. Mm -hmm. um, mills have to look at their source of logs that are coming in, where they're coming from, where is their end product going to be shipped to, what is our cost there. So at times these mills have to have a look at it and saying that um, this is not feasible anymore. We're in an area that the land is very valuable. Uh, our cost of transporting raw material in, finished pr product out, outweighs it. Uh, and they just either move on uh, in a different area or just shut a division down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the Vancouver area, well, we all know what happened in Falls Creek, mm -hmm. all the development there. and. And again, you know, uh, pollution does pay, play a, a huge role in it. Uh, many years ago, it, you know, it wasn't controlled like it is today. So that, that, played, a, that played a huge role in, in what's going to happen. Uh, coming along over the, probably the last 15 years or so, uh, the lower part of uh, Vancouver along Marine Drive area, there was very, very heavy for sawmills. Mm -hmm. There's only a few left along there, uh, which was uh, uh, a lot of truck traffic and everything else. But again, uh, those operations shut down due to the value of land. And 
So a lot of our mills now are in the interior. They're they're built and right at the, the source of the uh, of the raw material, and they they rail the, a lot of the wood down. Do you did you have you uh, as as the trucking business has changed for you and you've moved more into into um, making chips and so on? Have you have you invested in um, barges yourself? No, no, I haven't. Um, that's that's a different game altogether. That's uh, you might say for the majors that are in the towing industry, mm-hmm. uh, we would never have enough traffic to to um, to actually subsidize the cost of, of, of. So what we do is we'll sell our product on the barge, and then it's it's uh, belongs to the pulp mills and they'll tow it. And, at their expense, and have it taken and un- unloaded at, at their pole mills, and they and they can afford to sustain those kind of contracts with the uh, with the mills. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, I just don't know how well this is going to work now for you. Is it going to pick up a lot of background? It, it it might, although we've got the okay, we've got it directed to you, okay. so hopefully it'll okay. be good. Um, how do you feel about these changes in Queensboro? This is where you've lived your whole life, I assume. Well, you know, like like any any um, any small community, you know, you don't want to end up as a bedroom community. You still want to have industry. Uh, it's just that the industry that I'm in with sawmills, it's um, first of all, it takes up a lot of land. That's one thing. It takes up a lot of valuable land when you're sitting in the heart of the city. So um, that's that's when the, when the, when these sawmills look at that and they look at the cost of transporting in and out of through traffic, the value of the land. How I feel about it, you know, it's it's a it's it's a it's a real shame to see the the old industry gone. I, I think it was a it was a different game altogether. It was is uh, everything was a much slower pace. It was. Uh, I guess as a businessman, I look at it like probably a lot of businessmen say, I really enjoyed it then, but it's sure getting tough today. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of business people think the same way. It's, uh, uh, business is uh, a lot, uh, it's more competitive today, there's more people in it, and there's only so much there in the pie. The pie is only so big, you can only cut it up so much. But to lose the industry, I guess the, you might say that uh, wood products, lumber, sawdust, everything is in my blood. It's 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 a uh, it's an industry that uh, when you're when you're young, you sort of grow up with it. It's in your family. It's like logging. If you talk, if you spoke to a logger, you know before a person even goes into the bush, they already know everything. It happens at the kitchen table. Mm-hmm. Well, basically, and you'll see for generations as has been over the years, there's been families that had three generations in in the sawmills. Now, with education and jobs and technology, everybody's going different ways. When technology come in, it took away a lot of jobs in the, in the forest industry. Mm-hmm. In the sawmills, where you might have been operating with 100 men, you only might need 50%. So, technology has taken a lot away from the sawmills, too. Yeah. Well, at one time, I feel, and I stand to be corrected, that if you had a piece of property along the river, you really thought it didn't have a lot of value. You know, you didn't want to live on the river. Okay? Uh, today, it's a different world. Everybody wants to live on the river. Now, what was on the river was industry. Whether you had your canneries, your sawmills, shipbuilding, whatever the case might be, was always on the water. So those industries are gone away due to value. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would you like to live on the? I think living on the river is sort of nice. You know, if you can watch the traffic on the river, the, the tugs and the tows going up and down the river, and, and the pleasure boats and things like that, uh, it, you'll even find you know some of the golf courses are getting close to the river. Great. So uh, it seems that everybody wants to be on the water. False Creek is one that really, really shows that where industry is completely moved out and it's all residential. 
uh, in Queensboro. Well, I guess when you, you when you've seen Queensboro being from farmland, uh, very very large to Chinese gardens that were it was all vegetable gardens and stuff like that. So you would have a huge vegetable garden, and then next to it would be a sawmill, and then a little bit over would be some homes. Uh, it, it, it's changed here for me. It's really changed. It's, it's a um, a very tight knit community that now the door is open and you have a lot of people have moved in that are looking for that sort of community type of living. There's people that I meet in here that are from Vancouver and from West Vancouver, North Vancouver, who have decided not to move out to the Fraser Valley but stop part way and Queensboro has been the stop. It's still a community. It's, it's still a fairly tight-knit community and, and a very safe community to say that. The downfall is we don't have a lot of employment. We just don't have a lot of employment in Queensboro. We just don't have the jobs that we would like to have here where we're in between two bridges and you don't have to travel. You can live in a very, very nice home and, and uh, have your garden and things like that um, and be within walking distance of things. But employment takes you out. If we were to have a couple of sawmills, that would probably keep another 300 people here. You, uh, as your as your work has moved away from Queensboro, have you ever considered following it, moving somewhere else? Not following my work so much. Um, I, I've uh, I've thought of it. Um, is it time to leave Queensboro? Is time you know, things have changed and everything else? Uh, but my heart's in Queensboro. And have you thought about have you thought about moving within Queensboro to maybe one of the or have you moved within Queensboro or you or you stayed in the same have you stayed in the same place? I've been in uh, I, I went from one home where I was raised in. Uh, I moved a couple of houses over after I got married, and then I moved to my present location for which I've been for the last twenty seven years or so. Okay. Um, my two children live in New Westminster in Queens Park area. Um, they asked me to come up that that way, and I'm going no, no. You know when you're no, yeah. And Queensboro is home. Uh, in, actually, in Queensboro, my my two brothers and my mother. So they're still living in Queensboro, and they don't want to move. Okay. No. And- what do your brothers do for work? My brothers are partnership with, with me. Okay. Uh, one of us is in this uh, service industry with me, uh, uh, but we're partners in our larger operation of the woods, wood recycling, I will call it now, because that's basically what we do. We have moved from the transportation trucking industry now into wood recycling, but only moving our own product. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, New Westminster has changed so much. You go down the waterfront. I mean, there was uh, there was uh, the way the industry was at that time with the, the the dock work and the freighters coming in. We had a lot of our bars and hotels were right along the waterfront, and it was it was almost hand in hand. It serviced the docks. So just to give you an idea that there was that much traffic at one time that there was four major hotels that. Uh, when you when you were uh, when when you were hauling product in and out of the uh, the new Westminster waterfront, um, uh, did you did you ever socialize there? Did you did you know any of the other people who worked there on the waterfront? Well, I, I uh, of course in the sawmill when you just about knew everybody who worked there. Uh, not necessarily that they lived in New Westminster, mm-hmm. but you knew everybody who worked in, in these operations. Uh, in in the city itself. Yes, I, I mean, I, I knew a lot of people because uh, up to today, uh, when you spent your whole life within a few miles, um, whether it's through uh, restaurants, banking, clothing stores, you name it, you sort of, it, it was, New Westminster still was considered those days a very tight community also. It's opened up a lot now. With, everything opens up with development, Does, regardless what area you live in, and then once the development comes in, you lose that. 
New Westminster is today is a very very nice city to live in. Very nice city. It's a, a, a safe city. Um, it's uh, you know our crime rate is is, is very low. Uh, I say that because I spent six years on the New Westminster Police Board, so I I just finished uh, last year. So it's, uh, I get to see all those stats and, and I know exactly what's what's. Uh, what position we're in in this city. Um, Queensboro here, it was the same way. It's still fairly safe, but development does bring in crime. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And we lose jobs with development. <laughs> Well, um, I just want to come up with a name. Um, I will in a second. But what it was when we, I built this pub here. There was absolutely nothing out here, nothing. Okay. It was what, a big. What, what year was that? Uh, Two thousand. Okay. Okay. But before I, the application with the liquor started, about eight years prior to that, so I was very early, early stage. Now there was nothing out here. Uh, and yes, it was it was a big gamble, but I, I had a vision that what was going to happen in Queensboro and, and what was happening in uh, the other side of the bridge, uh, the development that was going there, and you know we get a shortage of land, and it's going to eventually move over here. So it was something I wanted to do, uh, just to change a little bit from the industry, and that's why you see in the building here uh, a lot of this wood, of course, the timbers and the high ceilings and boards. Uh, I handpicked those from the sawmill that came. This a lot of this wood came from the mills just down the road. Uh, I had some timbers cut for me, Fantastic. and it was just everything was wood. If you look at the table back there, I had one of the mills cut that slab, and and uh, you know you don't see a lot. You don't see a lot of that stuff. So the care, the the, the the island was mainly sawmill was the employer. Okay, so I wanted to bring that into here. And so using these pictures, it sort of showed our, our, our customers that were coming in, whether they came from Vancouver, regardless where they came from, they come in here and they'll stand here. And we have this up to today. We'll have people walk the walls and just, wow. And that's why they're tagged, so that they had a, some idea what was in here. Most of the stuff you see in here is within a couple of blocks. The shipyard was behind here. The, the, Gun boxes were made down the end of the road. The big machine shop was on the end there. The swing bridge is still there. Uh, a lot of the stuff. So then we decided to put some more character into it. So the tin walls are, are from the Vancouver shipyard. So we threw that in. The boiler we made on site. And all the gauges and stuff that you see, and, and uh, the railings that are inside and outside are off our Canadian destroyers. Sorry, off what? The Canadian destroyers. Oh, okay. So what they, this one here, I don't recall the name of oh, maybe it's on a tag on one of them. Um, this one was taken out to San Diego, uh, the reef out there, and they dropped it in San Diego. So this fellow I knew, his job, and there was two of them in New Westminster, because he's just, he on the waterfront, and his job was to strip them, okay, to make it safe for the divers. And so that I used some of that, like the big, the big spotlight is up sitting up there, and, and uh, so I wanted to put a lot of character into of, of what's, so I put the Canadian Destroyers into it, I put the waterfront into it, uh, you know, the timbers were cut in Queensboro, and it's, I guess you might say, when someone walks in here that lives in Queensboro, this is my bar. You know, that was the reason for this design. Yes, in fact, that's a good question because I we just spoke about this yesterday, um, um, and I was with uh, uh, actually I was I was with uh, the mayor of New Westminster, and we were, we, were, we were having dinner, and we were talking about that how things change in New Westminster and how things change in Queens and stuff. Yes, there's there's many a time I'll walk in here in the evening, and no, I don't. Uh, there, I might know ten people. It, but it's changed. At one time, this island, uh, you knew everybody, including the, uh, in, 
including the children by first name. You knew exactly. But again, uh, we all face it. Development change. Development changes things. We're close to the end of time. Um, is there more? Do you have something pressing you want to ask? Um, I'm sure you do. <laughs> I mean, you, I can be reached by telephone too. If you want to attend minutes on a telephone, you think of something else, feel free to give me a call. And I mean, you, you uh, or email, and I'll call you back or something. Uh, um, I'm just on the run all the time, so um, don't feel bad that if I don't get back to you today, I, I will get back to you. Um, but you know, I'm sure you're going to come up with more questions. If you need to sit down again for another 20 minutes or half an hour or something, I'll be more than happy to try to work it in. Okay, I know it's very difficult to try to do what you're doing right sitting here, uh, and because yeah. and, you're going to think of things, and I'm of course now I know your questions. All of a sudden, I'm thinking of things that uh, <laughs> That's great. That, that I would like that information to be to share that information, especially anything to do with Queensboro. I, I, I you know, it's sort of in your heart when you've been on the waterfront, and you know, you know there's things that we never touched the growing up as a as a as a young fella we used to fish off the log booms al domas was one that used to fish with me gunderson's another one uh so a lot of the a lot of the a lot of the the, the young guys here and, and we used to just go out and onto the log boom and uh drop our line and we we're naughty boys because we weren't supposed to ca- catch sturgeons and and we caught sturgeon but we released them and you always looked over your shoulder because the tide moved and all of a sudden you'd be sitting on a boom that's in the middle of the river now and there might be a 50 foot gap between the shore. So you always want to, yes, and you know, the odd time somebody got caught uh, and they'd have to be rescued off. Uh, I've skated on the river in the slough of it here uh, back about, oh, it had to be about 50 years plus in the slough and I can say that I have skated part of the Fraser River. there's been um, times many years ago that my father actually walked out of the river. You know, it froze over the weekend because the, the, there was no activity, and they used to blast on Sunday night to, to break up the booms. And but I'm talking way back in the 30s and 40s. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, in the 40s, and 50s. Um, we used to. There was so many low spots in Queensbury here. We used to play hockey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fields that are flooded. So, we, so there was, for for a young guy growing up, there was a lot of activity. There was a lot of activity in things where you didn't have to leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much. I I know I know we're going to be following up there. There there's several things that I I know we're going to yep. need to follow up on. But okay. thank you.